Jimmy Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comments. It's Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020. For the second time in a year, the Republicans in the U.S. Senate have displayed their dereliction of duty. Because just like they refuse to hear witnesses or new evidence in the impeachment proceedings back in January, now most of them have fallen in line and agreed to support Trump's nominee for the Supreme Court seat recently vacated by the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They've all pledged to vote for the nominee who has not yet been identified. Or nominated. And this shows the cult power of Trump over his Republican followers. That they fear stepping out of line more than they actually fear, in some cases, losing their upcoming elections. And that description there applies most to Cory Gardner of Colorado who has decided that his fate hangs with Trump's. Now, I don't think that much of his Democratic opponent, John Hickenlooper, who briefly ran for president last year. But Gardner has decided, even though he's, uh, I believe, trailing Hickenlooper by eight or ten points in the polls, that his future only lies with Trump. And it was not unexpected that Lindsey Graham, despite the close re-election battle that he is engaged in in South Carolina, but he has repudiated what he said in 2016 and 2018, even claims that I want you to use my words against me, hold that tape. And his lame answer, to those who call him a hypocrite, is, I am certain if the shoe were on the other foot, referring to Democrats, that you would do the same. But see, the McConnell rule doesn't apply to Democrats. They didn't make it up out of whole cloth in 2016, when in February, McConnell said, oh, no, no, we can't take up the uh, nomination of Merrick Garland It's too close to the election. We're going to let the next president decide. And so I see this Trump cult and the Republicans who all fall in line like sheep as a real threat to the future viability of our system of government. They're clearly in violation of their oath to uphold and defend the Constitution in both the case of impeachment and the case of this opportunistic approach to packing the court with a young conservative who is anti-choice, anti-Obamacare. And that is just speculation based on the pool of people who have been named publicly. And so my hope, because at this point, these people coming forward, which includes Graham, Gardner, Grassley of Iowa, and now Mitt Romney, the fate is pretty well sealed. I will be surprised if the Republicans don't get this next justice confirmed to the court before November 3rd. And would this justice recuse herself if issues come up like an election contest involving Trump? Nah. What we have is a very dangerous power grab. And the polite practices of the past have been shredded in service of this idiot who has no regard for the Constitution, 
And I don't take seriously when Trump tells his mob rallies that he's going to negotiate for a third term. But that's just another insult to those of us who have some <laughs> residual belief that the Constitution is our contract with our government. And I am a little surprised at Romney. He showed a little courage by being the lone Republican to vote to sustain the impeachment charges and remove the president in January. And listen to this bullshit rationalization. The Constitution gives the president the power to nominate and the Senate the authority to provide advice and consent on Supreme Court nominees accordingly. I intend to follow the Constitution and precedent in considering the president's nominee. If the nominee reaches the Senate floor, I intend to vote based upon their qualifications. Now, he at least offered a little wiggle room. But most of the Republicans have said, hey, put up a conservative with a pulse and I'll rubber stamp it. And this is even more insulting. Because I heard Rush Limbaugh reference this this morning, and then Trump echoed the loudmouth on the radio, saying it would be great if the Republicans used their Senate majority power to just skip the committee hearings. Because after all, the stable genius knows what's best. And even though he just relies on the Federalist Society and a couple of cronies in the White House to pick his nominees, and he, he's not skilled in the law, he simply knows what he thinks his voters want to hear. That he is going to produce a nominee who will overturn Roe versus Wade, kill Obamacare, allow more corporate power in elections and other sectors of our political game. That's all he cares about. So yesterday, in my comments about the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I dismissed the arguments that I've seen on Facebook and elsewhere. Then, oh, she was selfish. She knew as she was getting old, she'd had a bout of cancer. She should have retired while Obama was still president. And a lot of this is, you know, you're entitled to your views, but it's kind of wishful, revisionist thinking. Because she didn't choose to retire, and she didn't have to. And here's a comment from listener Tony Sassone in Vancouver, Washington. And it's interesting because he notes that... Uh, I've announced that I'll be retiring after the election is resolved, and he's a little disappointed by that. And then he adds, I've been retired for four years where every day is Saturday. Well, good for you, Tony. And he thinks that RBG should have retired. He says, uh, you cannot dismiss this. Whether we like it or not, A plus B equals C, and 1 plus 1 equals 2. In the pick we will get from Trump and the Republicans, RBG has to take responsibility for this. She chose a selfish route, not retiring in 2009 when she was 76, and the Senate had 57 to 58 votes for a couple of years and 60 votes between 2009 and 2010. She could have done a deal with Obama to get a short list of women that she approved of, but chose to stick it out until her death at 87. Probably good for her, but not so for the country. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> this hindsight requires so many caveats because you make these assumptions that from 2009, she could see that Obama would end up with a Republican House and a Republican Senate, Republican Senate during his second term. Likewise, Ginsburg could not predict that Trump would win. And so, you know, again, these scenarios are things that people are free to, to believe and to discuss. But I find it pretty much a waste of time. At the New York Times today, Emily Bazelon, 
kind of channels Ginsburg from, well, she's not the grave yet, <laughs> but let's say from the other side. Why didn't Ginsburg resign years earlier when Obama could have named a nominee for her seat? Ginsburg didn't think women should get to do what men did because she believed they would do the job better. She wanted equality for its own liberating sake. Litigating at the Supreme Court in the 70s, she helped achieve a series of victories that helped free women and men and transgender people from the confi confines of narrow, gender-based expectations. And she goes on to say, After Sandra Day O'Connor retired to take care of her ailing husband, who had Alzheimer's, she regretted it. Soon after she left the bench, his illness progressed to the point that he didn't recognize his wife. She told her biographer that retiring was the biggest mistake, the dumbest thing I ever did. And a former clerk of Ginsburg back in 2010-2011 said, I think O'Connor's departure served as something of a cautionary tale for Ginsburg. She still had a lot she wanted to see accomplished. And then after her own husband, Martin Ginsburg, died in 2010, her life revolved around love of her work says the same former clerk, David Newman. If you had a camera, trained her, a camera trained on her 24 7 the year I was clerk, you would have seen her during almost all her waking hours, reading, writing, editing, giving speeches, immersed in the law and the craft of judging. And in 2014, Ginsburg told a magazine, anybody who thinks that if I step down, Obama could appoint someone like me, they're misguided. She suggested no one as liberal as she could get confirmed and that her production had not slowed down. So those are her views. And again, fundamentally, I respect people who disagree, but I just don't think that bashing the late justice gets us anywhere. <laughs> we're, we're here, and you don't need Trump to tell you it is what it is. So we have some news today on voting rights issues. The North Carolina State Board of Elections has agreed to count mail ballots if they are postmarked by Election Day and received up to nine days later. That is a very generous rule that accounts for, say, the uh, dismantling of services at the post office by a political appointee of Trump. So this is good news, and it's a trend I would like to see continue because, uh, well, I don't think that Trump's attacks on voting by mail have any uh, rational basis, and his efforts to try to seal up a victory on election night are clearly ridiculous. I just saw an item that more than 60 million Vote-by-mail ballots have been dispatched to voters. And we know that in some states they're not even allowed to count those ballots until the polls close on November 3rd. So this is going to be a protracted vote count. It will be at least a week, if not 10 days, before even preliminary results from all the states can be considered possible. And in Nevada, where Trump has a special vendetta, when they announced that they were going to convert to a full vote-by-mail process this year, well, Trump's lawyers had argued that the law passed by the Democratic-led uh, state legislature is unconstitutional, removes election safeguards, and would allow people to cast votes after Election Day. The case has been dismissed by U.S. District Judge James Mahon, he said the Trump campaign and Republicans made allegations that were policy disagreements but did not show any constitutional harms. He said Trump's campaign asked the court to rule in the case to clear confusion over the new law but noted that it didn't ask for any injunction to block the law or any speedy court proceedings, leaving the case poised for a last-minute decision before the election. And the judge said that the underlying arguments were too speculative and too generalized. Mike Bloomberg, who has promised to spend up to $100 million to 
secure Florida for Joe Biden, is making good on his pledge. He has uh, contributed and raised money from others, totaling almost uh, 17, well, no, $22 million to pay off the leftover fines and fees of people who were formerly incarcerated. And Amendment 4, which voters passed in Florida overwhelmingly in 2018, restored their right to vote, and then the Republican-controlled legislature and Governor DeSantis, they, (laughs) they undid that action. They unrestored the voting rights by saying, well, you haven't completed your sentence, this is a law they passed, until you've paid all your fees and fines. And many of these voters are not in a position to do so. So Bloomberg is uh, pumping money into a fund that has already received contributions from LeBron James and John Legend and uh, some major league sports teams, Comedy Central, Ben and Jerry's, Levi Strauss. There are almost uh, 775,000 people who are in this category. They have served their sentences, but they can't afford to repay the fees. Last week, Olivia Troy, a former senior advisor to the White House Coronavirus Task Force who had worked for Mike Pence, she announced that she was uh, not able to vote for Trump again. She would be voting for Biden because of what she saw in the Trump White House, his flat-out disregard for human life, she said. So now they have trotted out uh, retired Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, who is also a Pence advisor, and he is the designated assassin for Olivia Troy. And he said, she worked for me. I fired her. I fired her because her performance had started started to drop after six months working on the task force as a backbencher. So he plays down her role and basically says that he escorted her off of the White House compound. But Olivia Troy says, well, not so fast. He's telling a bald-faced lie to protect the president. I resigned on my own accord. I was asked to stay. Uh, The general never escorted me out. He knows this. I wrote a note thanking all the colleagues who had worked so hard with me in spite of the president, and I stand by that. So that shows you what you get. If you uh, (laughs) jump the, uh, the ship, the USS Trump. I want to take a moment here for my California listeners and urge you to vote against Proposition 22 on the November ballot. And I wrote an op-ed that I submitted to the San Francisco Chronicle, and they have not had the wisdom to publish it. And it is in response to the Chronicle's endorsement of this special interest ballot measure that Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash are spending more than $120 million, mostly on deceptive ads, to promote. And I think the letter speaks for itself, so I'll read it and then maybe add some comments. I wrote, Using tortured logic, glaring omissions, and plenty of hemming and hawing, Chronicle opinion editors endorse Proposition 22. The initiative, heavily funded by Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash, seeks to rewrite state labor law again to suit the predatory business models of these disruptive tech startups. These businesses have operated outside the law from their inception by brazenly ignoring the longstanding definition of independent contractors under state law and IRS rules. They've also overrun the regulated taxi industry with tacit approval of elected officials and regulators, destroying the fortunes of many hardworking cab drivers who paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for license medallions that are now virtually worthless. The companies also exploit their workforce, shifting the capital costs of owning and maintaining vehicles to the drivers, the minimal improvements to the terms for those employees that are included in Prop 22, are clear acknowledgement of the paltry compensation offered by the investor-funded tech companies. For the $180 million, I'm sorry, I understated that, that they are spending on deceptive ads, They could improve wages and working conditions, but they choose to write their own regulations instead. In those ads, they use the faces and voices of drivers who often earn less than minimum wage 
to mouth their self-serving talking points. And the Chronicle endorsement amplifies these points while omitting the obvious. These drivers will be expendable as soon as these predatory companies can convert to self-driving cars. AB5 was a poorly drafted law with negative impacts on true independent contractors, like musicians and freelance writers. It's been amended to fix most of those defects, and as your editorial rightly noted, the newspaper industry got its special interest exemption so it can continue to underpay its home delivery carriers, who, like Uber and Lyft drivers, must provide their own vehicles. While your editorial offers ample criticism of these industries, along with several cheap shots at labor unions, it fails to note the thinly-veiled extortion ploy of the so-called ride-hailing services, who claim that AB5 will force them to shut down all service in California and put all of their drivers out of work. This is a well-worn tactic, most recently used by billionaire bad boy Elon Musk, Elon Musk and your failure to reject it is inexcusable. So I encourage California voters to think very carefully about this. The newspaper editorials are all lining up for Uber and Lyft, and uh, maybe they expect to get some free rides. I don't know. And speaking of California politics here and the election coming up, today I'm releasing an in-depth interview with Shahid Buttar. He is the man who is taking on Nancy Pelosi for her seat in the House of Representatives. And he makes a very strong case from a progressive, socialist, democratic point of view. Here's an excerpt from my conversation with Shahid Buttar. Uh, The the very reason I'm running as a Democrat against the party leader is precisely to help shift the party's direction. I'd say that there is a wide spectrum of voices within the party. Representative Ocasio-Cortez has made this point that in no other country would someone like her and someone like Joe Biden be lumped together in the same party. It's frankly absurd that, you know, someone as conservative as Joe Biden shares the same party with voices like ours. Uh, And at the same time, there is basically an ongoing fight going on within and across the country over, are we going to be a Democratic Party more like Joe Biden, one that defers to the past and doubles down on many of our failed predatory corporate policies and engineers future crises? Or are we going to be a party that leans into the transformative vision offered by the squad that puts communities before corporations, that puts sustainability before resource extraction and plunder, that puts future generations before the greed of the present, uh, and that puts people before capital. Ultimately, I think that's the vision that America needs. And it's one that we can achieve, certainly not through the Democratic Party as it's currently constituted, but if we knock out some figureheads and send signals to the rest of the party, the one signal I aim to send to the party is that if you are an urban centrist Democrat and you don't show up for your communities, your communities will show you the door. And if we are able to remove the strongest corporate Democrat in the entire body, I think that signal will be one that the rest of them will be very hard pressed to ignore. That's Shahid Buttar, who is challenging Nancy Pelosi for her congressional seat in the November election. As you'll hear in the interview, I've known Shahid for 15 years since he was the guy who ran the Bill of Rights Defense Committee. We had many conversations during that time, and we discuss uh, all kinds of issues, including uh, freedom from surveillance and Pelosi's role in a number of setbacks for working people and uh, those who are not part of the 1%. So I hope you'll check it out. He also honestly discusses the smear campaign that was launched against him this summer. And I want to note that I was going to bring it up, but he brought it up before I did, to his credit. And I think he makes a strong case that he was falsely accused by people who had been working on his campaign and were uh, disappointed when he didn't ask them to continue. Among uh, the topics that I discover that I discuss, I'm sorry, with Shahid Buttar, includes Joe Biden's sorry record on criminal laws, the 1994 crime bill that he took credit for, the crack cocaine disparity with uh, powder cocaine that has sentenced African Americans to lengthy jail and prison terms, and conveniently, uh, Alan McLeod, 
yesterday at Mint Press News published a, a strong recap of the criminal justice extremism of Joe Biden. And I think that uh, you'd be well advised to take a look at it if these are issues that you're concerned about. It's also interesting that uh, Alan McLeod brings up Plan Columbia, and that was a deal going all the way back to 1999 that was, uh, you know, part of the Clinton administration's efforts to militarize Colombian society. And what's interesting is that just this week, Colombia began a discussion about legalizing cocaine as the only way to end its part of the failed war on some drugs. Also under McLeod's byline at Mint Press News is an important story that was published uh, almost a week ago. And uh, I have been looking for the right opportunity to share it with you. There's just been such a, a rush of news stories. But it's a topic that I brought up in my conversation with Shahid Buttar, that there is bipartisan support for regime change driven by the Trump administration in Venezuela. And I mentioned to Buttar that uh, there was a recent PBS NewsHour story about Venezuela. It relied almost entirely on sources linked to Juan Guaido, who is this uh, fake uh, uh, would-be president who has been embraced by the Trump administration and other world governments have followed suit. And the Democrats have largely fallen in line, and there are also no critics in the corporate media. So it's uh, quite the uh, example of fascism. And I commend Alan McLeod for his reporting on both of these subjects. Every day I pause for a minute to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. And John Zwiebel gets special mention. He uh, chips in $10 on the first of every month. And uh, he was the one who was uh, uh, <laughs> repeatedly requesting that your humble host do an interview with Shahid Buttar. So uh, I have delivered on that for you, John. And you always deliver for me. So uh, I think we have a good quid pro quo here. Also, I want to mention Andrew Rush, Brian Mazzi, Stuart Russell, and Malachi De Lorenzo, who stopped by for a 24-hour pass just a week or so ago. They've all chipped in to support the Peter B. Collins podcast. Will you? All you have to do is visit peterbcollins.com forward slash sign up. And here's today's recap of the ongoing extradition hearing for Julian Assange being conducted at the Old Bailey in London. And we start with the report on yesterday's session from Kevin Gostola at Shadowproof. And it's interesting because Craig Murray, who offers pretty detailed reports, was actually out getting a cup of coffee when uh, Cassandra Fairbanks' testimony was presented. And uh, she is a reporter for the conservative website, The Gateway Pundit. And she used her connections with Trump administration figures, including a guy named Schwartz, uh, Arthur Schwartz, who handled communications for Rick Grinnell. And this gets a little comp complicated because Grinnell was the ambassador to Germany, but he had several other assignments from Trump, including a short stint as the director of national intelligence. But you take it back a couple of years, Schwartz, working for uh, Grinnell, was a source for Fairbanks, who then shared the information that she got from Schwartz with Julian Assange. And that is that Trump was getting ready to make a deal with Ecuador to end the asylum protection he had at their embassy in London and to arrest him and extradite him to the United States. So Fairbanks uh, also interviewed Christine Assange, Julian's mother, and uh, Schwartz called her 10 minutes after it was published, and he said he was outraged that uh, uh, his confidence to Fairbanks had been, he thought, violated. And she said, I didn't agree our conversation was off the record, though he did tell me not to tell anybody about the call. And Fairbanks said Schwartz brought up her nine-year-old child, which she perceived as an intimidation tactic. Quote, 
Schwartz repeatedly insisted that I stop advocating for WikiLeaks and Assange, telling me that a pardon isn't going to fucking happen. He knew very specific details about a future prosecution against Assange that were later made public and that only those very close to the situation then would have been aware of. He told me that it would be the Manning case that he would be charged with and it would not involve the Vault 7 publication or anything to do with the DNC. He also told me they would be going after Chelsea Manning. So that proved to be uh, almost 100% accurate. And Fairbanks said, I believe that this connected, this is later, uh, that Schwartz's phone call connected President Trump to those who have been reported as having secured the deal to arrest Assange. I believe Schwartz, Schwartz's statement to be correct because his close personal ties to both Trump and Grinnell are well known. Then we turn to the coverage of Craig Murray. Again, this is yesterday's session in, uh, in London. And he is frustrated with the Assange defense team. He said Monday was a frustrating day as the hearing drifted deep into a fantasy land where nobody knows or is allowed to say that people were tortured at Guantanamo and under extraordinary rendition. The willingness of Judge Baratzer to accept American red lines on what witnesses can and cannot say has combined with a joint and openly stated desire by both judge and prosecution to close this case down quickly by limiting the number of witnesses, the length of their testimony, and the time allowed for closing arguments. For the first time, Murray says, I am openly critical of the defense legal team who seem to be missing the moment to stop being railroaded and say, no, this is wrong, forcing Baratzer to make rulings against them. Instead, most of the day was lost to negotiations between prosecution and defense as to what defense edits, uh, evidence could be edited out or omitted. And then he relates the exchange between uh, the testimony or the testifying witness, uh, Christian Grothoff, who is a professor of computer science. We referred to him yesterday. And the issue is, uh, when were the encryption keys released in a book by the Guardian reporters, David Lee and Luke Harding, that allowed almost anyone to gain access to the uh, Iraqi war logs that were published in February of 2011. And that uh, continues to be an issue because the prosec prosecution has claimed that uh, WikiLeaks and Assange were careless in the redaction of names included in those logs, when in fact the opposite appears to be true based on the testimony. And later on, Murray writes, the next witness, Andy Worthington, was at court and ready to give evidence, but was prevented from doing so. The U.S. government objected to his evidence about his work on the Guantanamo detainee files being heard because it contained allegations of inmates being tortured at Guantanamo. And this is a bizarre objection because, at most, it's going to enhance the arguments that the extradition of Assange would be political, which is barred by the U.S.-U.K. extradition treaty. Baratzer said, well, her ruling isn't going to consider whether torture took place or if extraordinary rendition had even happened, that she did not need to hear evidence on these points. Yet, I believe that they buttress the argument that this has a very strong political element. So, uh, also, a little later in his post, Murray writes, the defense did not say uh, any of that, but is instructed to enter a process with the prosecution lawyers of agreeing the shortening and editing of evidence, a process which took all day, and which, with which Assange showed plain signs of being uncomfortable. Andy Worthington did not get to give his evidence. And so... Near his conclusion, Murray writes, I'm very concerned about the obvious collusion of the prosecution and the judge to close this case down. The extraordinary conflation of time management and excluding evidence which the U.S. government does not want heard in public is plainly illegitimate. The continual chivying and interruption of defense counsel in examination 
when prosecution counsel are allowed endless repetition amounting to harassment and bullying is illegitimate. And then we turn to today's summary from Consortium News, which I have learned is all being written by Joe Laria, and uh, the reason he has not often listed his byline is because of uh, silly rules with the court in London about how many people from a news outlet can monitor the proceedings. And they pick up with the introduction of uh, Professor Michael Koppelman, who is a, a professor of neuropsychology at King's College in London. He has examined Julian Assange and testifies that he's suffering from severe depression, loss of sleep, appetite, and weight. He also found a high risk of suicide if extradition appears imminent. And Koppelman said Assange has had a history of clinical depression, said his risk of suicide would increase if extradition is considered imminent. And uh, they note here that they're limiting the detail of some of the testimony about Assange's mental health conditions uh, in honor of his privacy. And they note ruling against extradition on medical grounds would, it seem, bypass the political controversies in this case. So, as usual, Attorney Lewis for the prosecution for the United States is trying to question Koppelman's credentials. They do that every time. Lewis's main focus in cross-examination was to establish that Assange may be exaggerating or faking his mental condition during exams by Koppelman. In particular, Lewis grilled Koppelman on an incident which Assange said he concealed a razor blade and two cords in his prison cell, but the incident doesn't show up in prison records. And there's some almost comical exchanges where Lewis tries to impeach the integrity of the witness, Dr. Koppelman. And Koppelman says that Assange had passed a test about whether a patient is exaggerating an illness or malingering, as the British would say. So Lewis asks, was that the Minnesota test? No, Koppelman, it was the Tom test, Lewis. The Tom is not a test for malingering, he arrogantly shot back. Koppelman, yes it is. Tom stands for test of memory malingering. <laughs> and uh, Laria notes it's a rare instance of Lewis being reduced to humiliated silence. And there was another exchange where he tried to undermine Koppelman, and Koppelman got the better of him. So uh, I encourage you to follow the coverage. I link every day to the latest reports from Shadowproof, from Consortium News, and from the blog of Craig Murray. Well, Andrew Weissman was one of the top investigators, prosecutors, on the Mueller team. And in service of his new book called Where Law Ends, we're being teased with excerpts. And he says, yeah, we could have done more. And as you may know, if you're a regular listener, I have referred to the investigation and report by St. Bob Muller as a limited hangout investigation. Weissman says Muller and his top deputy, Aaron Zebley, avoided steps that would lead to confrontation with the White House, including subpoenas for financial records and interviewing the president and members of his family. Quoting Weissman, Repeatedly during our 22 months in operation, we would reach some critical juncture in our investigation, only to have Aaron say that we could not take a particular action because it risked aggravating the president beyond some undefined breaking point. Weissman says Mueller was afraid of being fired. He writes, Had we used all available tools to uncover the truth, undeterred by the onslaught of the president's unique powers to undermine our efforts— I know the hard answer to that simple question, we could have done more. And in particular, on the what were outlined in the Mueller report were the elements of obstruction of justice. And I have long argued since the report came out that uh, that is what Congress should have pursued, not the part one of the report, which was very lame in uh, trying to establish the so-called Russian meddling in the 2016 election. Weissman uh, refers to Bill Barr. He has betrayed both friend and country. 
And uh, one final quote from Mr. Weissman. There's no question I was frustrated at the time. There was more that could be done that we didn't do. He says he doesn't blame Mueller alone. I would say the office. There are a lot of things we did well, a lot of things we could have done better to be diplomatic about it. And uh, there's another tell-all book that is uh, due out today. October Surprise, How the FBI Tried to Save Itself and Crashed an Election. It's written by FBI agent John Robertson. He was assigned to examine Anthony Weiner's laptop computer after Weiner was accused of digital correspondence with a 15-year-old girl. And what he found on the computer were oodles of Hillary Clinton emails that had been forwarded to Weiner's wife at the time, Huma Abedin, who was the special assistant to the Secretary of State. So uh, this is not really surprising, but it's the insider story of how this agent, Robertson, tried to get the attention of FBI brass in Washington, and they frittered away the whole month of September. He knew about this. He made his first report like around the 10th of September, and by the middle of October, he was very concerned and thought he was going to be made a scapegoat. And so the prosecutors he, were, he was working with in the Southern District of New York, and they kind of uh, <laughs> uh, tased him verbally, saying that if he leaked about this, that he could be prosecuted. And so it is an interesting insider view of why James Comey went public to say we are reopening the investigation and then just days before the election say, saying that we had conducted an investigation of all of these emails and concluded that she didn't do anything wrong. And it was bad form all the way around, and it pissed off uh, both supporters and opponents of Hillary Clinton. And speaking of SDNY, we are learning that a federal judge has issued a sharp rebuke. Her name is Allison Nathan, Federal District Court in New York. She excoriated the government for its handling of a case against an Iranian businessman accused of illegally funneling uh, over $100 million to his family business. Well, the issue here is that the prosecutors at SDNY, and this would have occurred under Jeffrey Berman, who was described as the straightest of straight shooters, they hid evidence from the defense. And there's a paper trail of their discussion about how we bury this uh, document in a stack of other papers. And the judge has issued an order that every prosecutor at SDNY must read her findings, her judgment. And I think they have to uh, have some continuing education as well. Facebook uh, says it was an accident, but they suspended the accounts of several env environmental organizations, Greenpeace, Rainforest Action Network, Climate Hawks Vote. They were blocked over the weekend, and activists say hundreds of other individual accounts were also blocked. And all these people were involved in a Facebook event from last May where they targeted, I'm sorry, a year ago, May, where they targeted a, an investment bank, KKR, that is backing the coastal gas link pipeline. And so they smell a rat. Facebook says the accounts have been restored. Our systems mistakenly remove these accounts and content. Meanwhile, Facebook is threatening it may pull out of Europe entirely because the Ireland's, uh, Ireland's Data Protection Commissioner is trying to enforce a ban, enforce a ban on sharing data with the United States. This follows a landmark ruling by the European Court of Justice in July. In a court filing in Dublin, Facebook's uh, general counsel wrote that enforcing the ban would leave the company unable to operate, and so they're threatening to pull the plug in Europe. The wildfire report here in the West is getting a little better. The Bobcat fire is still advancing at a one or two miles an hour. This is east of Los Angeles uh, and just east of uh, Pasadena 
in the San Gabriel Mountains. That fire started on September 6th. It's destroyed at least 29 homes, and it is not uh, fully contained at this point. We still have 19,000 firefighters up and down California battling 27 major blazes. Colorado has a new serious fire. The Cameron Peak Fire near Red Feather Lakes has covered 162 square miles and is only 15% contained. And uh, in addition to the firefighters in California, now numbering 19,000, there are 9,000 continuing to battle fires in Oregon and in Washington State. Now to our police misconduct blotter. You heard maybe the case of a 13-year-old Utah boy with autism. His mom called the police asking for help to get him into mental health treatment. And when the cops showed up, newly released videos show that Salt Lake City officers chased him down an alley. After they arrived at his home, they yelled at him to get on the ground, and then they shot him 11 times. He is still alive, but uh, recovering in a hospital. And the family members are very upset, as you can imagine. In Seattle, the police department has decided to drop their subpoena, demanding that five Seattle news organizations turn over unpublished news videos and photos going back to the racial justice uh, demonstrations on May 30th. And this is a contentious issue that violates uh, the uh, media protection law in the state of Washington. And so lawyers for the police department said that they are dropping their appeal because uh, they found other videos without the subpoena and the process is going to take too long. And as we've mentioned over the past few days, Attorney General Barr is trying to federalize cases that stem from protests, make them federal cases. And the latest involves an event that occurred last Friday night in southwest Portland because they're accusing Nicholas Bantista of throwing a rock that struck the helmet of a Federal Protective Service officer. But the young man, I think he's 22 years old, I'm sorry, he's only 20, he said that it was a bouncy ball. And so... Is any projectile thrown at a police officer or a federal marshal a basis for a federal prosecution? I don't think so. This is just another (laughs) arrogant, staged effort by Trump's favorite lawyer, Bill Barr. Here's today's COVID-19 update prepared by Linda Lewis. The U.S. has crossed the threshold of 200,000 deaths based on a reported 6.8 million cases that are confirmed worldwide. The death toll stands still just a little below a million at 965,000. And yesterday, the report of new cases nationwide was up to 54,000, and the number of reported deaths at 428. Axios has published a piece called We Blew It. I'll read you some quotes. America spent the spring building a bridge to August, spending trillions and shutting down major parts of society. The expense was to be a bent coronavirus curve and the other side some semblance of normal, where kids would go to school and their parents to work. The bottom line, we blew it. We blew testing. Trump regularly brags and complains about the number of tests conducted in the U.S., but America hasn't built the infrastructure necessary to process and trace the results. We blew schools, they say. Congress allocated $150 billion for state and local governments as part of the CARES Act, but that was aimed at maintaining status quo services in face of plummeting tax revenue. There was no money earmarked for schools to buy new safety equipment, hire additional teachers who might be needed for smaller class sizes and hybrid learning programs. We blew economics. The CARES Act was bold and bipartisan, a massive stimulus to meet the moment, but it's running out with no extension in place. We blew public health. 
had we all been directed to wear face masks in March uh, and done so, even makeshift ones while manufacturing ramped up, you might not be reading this post. In Britain, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced new virus-related restrictions, says the country has reached a perilous turning point. Quote, this is the moment when we must act, Johnson said. The new measures are designed to save lives and livelihoods, could stay in place for the next six months. Greater, greater penalties for breaking virus restrictions will be introduced, and Johnson promised that mask-wearing rules would be more strongly enforced. Fines for failing to wear a mask or for meeting with more than six people could double to 200 pounds, about $260 at today's exchange rate. At one of his uh, mob rallies last night, Trump uh, diminished once again the impact of COVID as we passed the 200,000 death mark. He incorrectly claimed that COVID-19 affects virtually nobody younger than 18, again downplaying the extent of the pandemic and contradicting his previous statements. It affects elderly people, elderly people with heart problems and other problems. That's what it really affects, he said. In some states, thousands of people, nobody young, below the age of 18, like nobody. They have a strong immune system. Who knows? Take your hat off to the young because they have a hell of an immune system. He's not recognizing that even if they're young and healthy, if they become infected, they can spread the virus to other people, you know, like their parents and grandparents and teachers and other people they have contact with. A new study uh, presented by John Nkengasong, who previously worked for the U.S. CDC and now is director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He said that the countries that Trump labeled shithole countries are doing much better than expected. On a continent of 1.3 billion people, Africa has seen just over 34,000 deaths, and uh, they show a mere 1.4 million confirmed cases. Now, that could be a result of limited testing. But he said earlier modeling had assumed a large number of Africans would just die. He said uh, he's happy to report that that is not the case. There was a, a mole, or do we call him a troll? inside the agency run by Dr. Anthony Fauci. And he has been exposed. His name is Bill Cruz, C-R-E-W-S. He is a PR official at the National Institutes of Health. And while on duty, according to the Daily Beast, he was tweeting critical comments about Fauci and his staff, the Daily Beast writes, Cruz isn't just a civil servant anonymously disagreeing with his bosses. He's actively undermining their work and even suggesting retribution against them. But the retribution hit Mr. Cruz today, who announced his retirement from the National Institutes of Health. And we have seen how the money intended to help little people navigate the Economic slowdown in the COVID crisis has been diverted to corporate interests. But what about the Pentagon? Well, the Washington Post today reports a $1 billion fund that Congress gave the Pentagon in March to build up our supplies of medical equipment has instead been mostly funneled to defense contractors and used to make things like jet engine parts, body armor, and dress uniforms. <laughs> Take that, pandemic. The Pentagon did initially plan to spend the bulk of the billion-dollar fund on medical supplies, but in June, they said that defense contractors had critical needs as well. And they needed to prop up these little mom-and-pop entities that do special manufacturing for the Pentagon. You know, like Rolls-Royce, GE Aviation. <laughs> Who else is in here? Boeing a Kansas aircraft parts business that uh, feeds Boeing. Yes, you get the idea. And if there is a vaccine, new polling indicates that a lot of people are allergic to it. 
Six in ten respondents said they wouldn't take a vaccine as soon as, as it's available. That's up from 53% just a month ago. A majority said they would wait at least a few months to get a vaccine. So here are the numbers. 13% they'd get it right, said they'd get it right away. 16% said they'd wait a few weeks. 18% would wait at least a year. And 23% would refuse to get the vaccine at all. You're not going to get to herd immunity with that level of participation. Over on Capitol Hill today, it was a duet from Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin and Federal Reserve Chairman Jerry Powell. Both of them gently suggested that the Congress has to shovel more money out of Washington into the hinterlands. Mnuchin said it should go to industries particularly hard hit. And Powell resumed his advocacy for bailouts of state and local government. But it doesn't appear anybody's listening. All they care about these days is the Supreme Court vacancy. The FDA is expected to spell out a tough new standard for an emergency authorization for a vaccine as soon as this week that will make it exceedingly difficult for any vaccine to be cleared before Election Day. And this is the, the game we're playing, where Trump says uh, it's in the mail. <laughs> Only the mail's been delayed. And the experts say, no, 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 it's not in the mail. It's not coming anytime soon. Here in California, they have suspended intake of new applications for unemployment assistance. This is because of the massive backlog. There are 600,000 Californians who applied just in the last three weeks, have not had their initial claims processed. An additional million people have received payments but subsequently had their claims halted for eligibility certification, and they're awaiting resolution. And that happened to me this summer, 98 days in between. They don't actually send you checks, but payments to my unemployment account. So this is a serious problem. I take the governor at his word that he's working on it. But we've known about this for a while, and it took him a long time to actually take serious action. I've heard a lot from the people who oppose masks. They say they don't do no good, that scientific research shows that they don't prevent the transmission of a airborne virus like COVID-19. And some people say that, uh, and I consider this to be far-fetched, that it actually makes things worse for people. And there are others who just think that it uh, imposes on their freedom. And there have been some ugly scenes from pro-mask people shaming others. And I deplore that. When I see people out in public who don't have a mask, I let them walk on by. It's not my business. I try to keep a little distance from them. But the other side of this coin is a clenched fist. And Anthony Reed, a 62-year-old transit bus driver in New York City, was on his last run in East New York, Brooklyn, when passengers complained that a man in the back was not wearing a face covering. So the driver, Reed, pulled over and got on the PA and reminded the guy that masks were required on his bus. And then he says, Reed does, that everything went dark. He woke up in the back of an ambulance, his left eye swollen, oh, swollen all the way shut, and the taste of warm blood in his mouth. It was a calm exchange with him, but then he just knocked me out cold, said Reed, who is still recovering from his eye injury that he suffered in July. Seven weeks on, there's still protesters in the streets of Minsk, calling for the resignation of longtime strongman Alexander Lukashenko. Also, we revealed yesterday the documents that show that the FinCEN scandal is going to be a big one. FinCEN is the agency that receives suspicious activity reports from banks in an attempt to police money laundering and criminal activity. What we see here are Suspicious activity reports detailing years of potential illegal banking transactions. 
More than 2,100 of these reports are considered historical documents by the implicated banks. But it appears that Deutsche Bank has the biggest exposure. They have suspicious activity records well over, uh, I see, totaling well over half of the $2 trillion sum that these files trace. And so the question arises, will Deutsche Bank be the fall guy here? Will all the other bankers point fingers at the Germans and see if that gets them off the hook? And finally today, an interesting story at the World Socialist website. I'm sure by now you've heard of the 1619 Project. It was published uh, in 2019, in August, in the New York Times. And the whole idea, the central claim, was that 1619 was the true founding of the United States. That's the year that the first slaves were brought to Virginia. So WSWS has figured out that the copy on the New York Times website has been scrubbed. And for example, this line here, I'll quote it to you and then I'll, I'll describe what's been removed. Quote, the project aims to reframe the country's history, understanding 1619 is our true founding. Well, that clause, understanding 1619 is our true founding, disappeared sometime, they think, last December. Also, a similar change was made from the print version of the 1619 Project, which has been sent to classrooms in all 50 states. The original version include the, included the line, America was not yet America, but this was the moment it began. That line has been removed. So I don't know the motivation. And quite frankly, I'm not sure of the impact. But these kinds of sneaky moves by the New York Times undermined the credibility of the work that was done and the claims that are being made. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast all the way to the end here. You're free to share it all over the place. You'll find it on YouTube. I'm Peter B. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails.